Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his holy name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples of the earth. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father, we desire to join with the nations in celebrating the risen Savior of all the earth, Jesus Christ, today. And as we have already sung the name above all names, Jesus, Son of God, we pray that your name would be exalted in this place, in this hour, and in our hearts. Jesus, we desire your name to be loved and cherished and adored and to be spoken of as if it were sweeter than honey to our lips. Something more desirable than anything in this earth. And we desire to join with creation in longing for your return. To rightfully restore all things as it was meant to be. But also to rightly have Christ as the center of all creation once again. And so at this time, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and do what only you can do, and that is to soften and change hearts, awaken the spiritual man, woman, soul within us to be alive through worship. So open our eyes that we may see and behold the wonderful things in your law. Open our ears that we will hear your voice and open our hearts that we would receive that word with joy and be changed by it today. Father, I surrender myself to you and I ask that you would cover me, clothe me, empower me with your spirit. And I ask for the humble honor of being used by you for your glory to speak forth your word in truth and faithfulness so that through the declaration of your word and through the hearing of your word, Christ would be exalted today. So let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it is in your precious name we pray. You know, we are all wired for worship. Uh, we see it uh, around the world on game day, in front of the TVs and the concerts around the world. We see that all the world is wired within us for worship. We know how to give praise to movies. We know how to give praise to our favorite bands. It is within the heart of every person ever born to seek and to find the one to whom we were ultimately meant to worship. And C.S. Lewis also observed this. He said that uh, all the earth is filled with praise. And you see this with lovers praising one another, readers praising their favorite books and authors, stadiums filled with, their, uh, with the praises for their favorite teams and sports, and we see it on Facebook feeds filled with likes and shares. Okay, so C.S. Lewis didn't say that one. Uh, but we see it naturally overflowing in the hearts of all humans within this planet. We are wired for worship. But unless we come to know the one to whom we are ultimately meant to worship, Jesus, unless we come to know who this man truly is, the heart of mankind will continue to look for and worship the wrong things ultimately in the end. 
You know, I shared with you before how during my three years in Vancouver, I loved my time at Regent College. For my seminary days, I loved the weather when it was sunny, but it was raining nine months out of the year. And I kid you not, at the end of the nine months of drizzle, when the sun would break forth for the first day when it's clear blue skies, I had these moments when I realized, man, I know why people used to worship the sun in some cultures. Because I would look at the sun and I would be like, I love you. You know, there was so much happiness and joy and praise overflowing from my heart. And you see it because everybody's outside on the first day of sun and they're worshiping the sun in their own unique ways. And so we are wired for worship. And again, until we really come to know the one to whom we were created to worship, we will strive for and look for things to worship, though they are not meant to be. So because of that, though we all worship, it is important for us to learn how to worship correctly uh, in a way that honors God, in a way that is outlined by God's word. And so that's what we want to explore today uh, through his word, how we can understand the foundations and the basics of worship. So we're currently in a new mini-series for this new year, and this is something that we like to do at the beginning of each new year, and that is to focus on some foundational uh, issues for our faith, looking at spiritual disciplines and various other elements to get our year started in the right direction that will ultimately honor God in the end. Last week, we looked at how time with God is the greatest use of time, the importance of building our lives and building the year on a foundation of prayer and His Word. And I was blessed to see so many people come out uh, for the first time to our OEM night of prayer on Wednesdays as well, uh, because we need to pray in order to learn how to pray. Uh, and so it is important for us to dive into the environments and opportunities of prayer and of worship to grow in prayer and worship as well. Now, today we're going to be focusing on worship, and that is a natural overflow of what we looked at last week. Because as we pray and encounter the living God, and as we study His Word, the natural overflow of encountering God and hearing from God is the worship of God. Because all theology is not an end in and of itself. Theology, the study of God, is meant to lead to doxology, the worship of God. The reason why we learn about God is so that we might know him better in order to express worship towards him better as well. And so this is a natural overflow of what we studied last week. As we pray, as we look into his word, the end result is worship. And that's what we want to look at today. How can we understand this foundational basis of worship? So turn with me to Psalm 98 in your Bibles, and we'll look at the basics of worship and how we can worship in a way that will honor God in the end. So follow along with me in your outlines as well. That's provided for you. So what are the basics of worship? Well, it begins with this. First place we need to begin is to understand that worship is looking up. So everyone repeat, worship is looking up. So worship is about us looking up to the one to whom we were ultimately created to worship, and that is God. Psalm 98, starting from verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Who is the subject of these verses? It is the Lord. Worship begins by looking at God because worship is God-centered. True worship is God-centered. It's not about us. It's not about how you feel. It's not about whether you like the praise team. It's not about whether you're familiar with the praise song. It's not about you. True worship is God-centered, and it is about God. Amen? 
He is the central factor on what makes worship, worship. So worship begins by looking up to God, to behold who he is and to behold what he has done. Those are the t- key elements of understanding our looking up towards worship. So worship is beholding and blessing who he is, that he is the Lord, God Almighty. And one of the ways that we can grow in our worship is by studying, meditating on, and praising the names of God that he has revealed through his word. So we provided for you in the back of your outline uh, a list of different names of God that you can learn, be familiar with, learn to pray these names, pray through these names, worship God who is revealed through these names. And we've provided this for you in our last Wednesday night of prayer as well. But we want to understand that God has revealed himself through different names for reasons. And as we come to understand that reason, we use that understanding, that theology, to let us lead us into proper worship, praise, and doxology of who he is. For example, when you pray for healing, when someone is sick and you are praying for healing, yes, we pray that God would heal them, but also learn to incorporate the name that he has revealed himself to us through, and that is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. So we learn to use the name that he's revealed to us. And God, this is who you are, Jehovah Rapha. This is who you have revealed yourself to be. You created me, you made me, and you can heal me. And so we learn to pray by honoring the name that was revealed to us. Or when you feel alone, when life hurts, we learn to pray to and worship to El Roy, our God who sees. So everyone say El Roy. So our God who sees. Now, when did this name of God get revealed? In Genesis 16, 13, when Hagar, the servant to Abram's wife, Sarai, became pregnant and Sarai became jealous because, again, they were promised a son, but she's still not pregnant yet and Abram is still wondering when it's going to happen. And so Sarah gives her servants Hagar to Abram, saying, hey, you know, maybe our our promised son will come through her, so why don't you sleep with her? And then he did, and she conceived, and then Sarah became very jealous and angry. And so she mistreated her servant, Hagar. And so Hagar runs away. She's weeping, and she's in pain because of the mistreatment. And as she's sitting near a spring of water, again, brokenhearted, wondering what's going to happen, she just left her place of work, her security. She has no idea what's going to happen, how she's going to raise her child. An angel of the Lord appears to her and says this in Genesis 16, 11. The Lord has listened to your affliction. He has heard the pain coming from your hearts. That is a fascinating revelation about who our God is. He hears the pain of our hearts. Then in verse 13, he says, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are Elroy. You are the God who sees. No one else is around here. She was alone. She ran away. She was secluded. No one else knew what was going on. And even if they saw her running away, no one knew the pain that was going on in her heart. But God did, and God revealed himself through the angel saying, the Lord has heard the pain of your heart. And then she worships this God who has revealed himself to be a God who sees and says, God, I worship you for you are Elroy. You are the God who sees. And then she says, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. That is our God. Our God is the one who looks after his children. God sees your heart. And God is committed to looking after you. Amen? That is our God. That is El Roy. 
And when we come to understand this theology of this study of God, of who he is, we cannot just keep it within our mind and contain it within our hearts. We need to learn how to express it into worship back to this God who sees all things. In her pain, in her aloneness, God was there. In her suffering, God sees the affliction of her heart. Not only sees, she, he hears the pain going on in her life. He is El Roy. He is the God who sees your suffering, your pain. He sees your loneliness, and he knows your tears. What an amazing God we serve. Amen. He not only sees, he is there. Because he cares. And so we let that guide us into worship. This awesome God who sees all things. You see, learning to worship another aspect of God's character or his name is like discovering a new side of a multifaceted diamond. You see, God is beautiful and glorious, and there is no way in all of eternity that we will fully be able to comprehend all that God is in the beauty, splendor, and glory of his majesty. But God has allowed in our finite frailness to come to know different parts of who he is. He has revealed his name, his character, his attributes throughout the revelation of his word. And as we study another element and come to understand this God, this El Shaddai, this Adonai, this Lord Almighty, we come to this diamond and see a little more of his glory. And that leads us into worship. The names of God give us focus for our worship and substance for our faith. So that we don't just worship out of pure emotion with an empty head, but a beating heart. True worship is worship done in spirit and in truth. When the mind comes to grow in understanding, it allows the heart to grow in passion. That is how the worshiper is to grow. Amen? And so this understanding of his names will deepen our prayer lives, mature our worship, and it will give you greater substance for your praises to God. It is vital to grow as a worshiper in this way, to learn who our God is by learning his names, that he is the great I am, that he revealed himself to Moses when Moses was called to go to Pharaoh, and he was like, who should I tell him sent me? And God says, I am. And I would have been like, okay, I'm waiting. You are? Okay. Who are you, God? I am. I am who I am. But that's not going to help me either. I'm a God. Come on. I am who I am. That's all that I am. Why did he leave it somewhat ambiguous? It was intentional because God cannot be contained. He cannot be defined by our own vocabulary. He leaves it open, but also for another reason, because he is all, it's almost as if Moses is saying, you want to know who I really am? What do you need, Moses, when you encounter Pharaoh, when you encounter what people consider the greatest leader of this planet at the time? Who do you need? What do you need? Because you fill in the blank. I will be all that you need. I am the Lord. You need healing? Then I am your healer. You need provision? Then I am your provider. You need deliverance, and I am your deliverer. God is saying, I am with you, and I am all that you ever need. That is our God. Because if you have God, you have everything that you could ever need. And he's saying, as you go forth in my name, trust me. 
and know that I will be everything you ever need. Amen? That is our God. That is our awesome God. And that is the one we worship. So worship is looking up and beholding who he is, and it is beholding and blessing what he has done. Look at verse 1 again. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. And what is that marvelous thing that he has done? His right hand and his only arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. So what is this psalmist praising the Lord about? For who he is, that he is the Lord. He alone is God, but also he is praising him for what he has done. He has worked salvation for his people, for those who trust in him. The great work that is worthy of praise is the great work of Jesus' death upon the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and grant us salvation and life in him and life with him forever. He worked salvation for us, and he is worthy to be praised for that. It is not our works that earn us salvation. Only the work of God. Only the work of God through Christ, His Son, on the cross. And the great work of salvation is when God delivered us from our sins because the greatest problem that we will ever face is our sin. Sin separates, sin divides, sin destroys, sin leads to death. But God has dealt with sin to give us life. And so worship looks up to the cross and says to the world, look up. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is a call to worship. Look up and behold our God who reigns. Amen? That is foundational for worship. To grow as a worshiper. It is not, do I feel like worshiping it? It's not, well, I'm not in OEM, so... You know, I don't feel like worshiping. I don't like how that worship leader is dressed. I don't like how she sounds. I don't like how he plays. It's not about you. It's not about instruments. It is not about sound. It is not about keeping in harmony or even singing in tune, as distracting as it can be. The basic foundation of worship is we look up to God who is worthy to be worshipped, no matter where you are, no matter how the songs sound, no matter how fast the pace is, because it's not about us. It is about God. It begins with looking up and beholding the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? But that is not all. Worship begins with looking up, but also... Worship is lifting up. So everyone repeat, worship is lifting up. All right, so worship is lifting up our hearts, our voices, and our hands in worship. Worship begins with God. We look up, behold his goodness, and then we respond you see, God reveals who he is, what he has done, and we respond in glad worship. That is the proper rhythm of worship. You see, worship, again, it does not begin with us saying, okay, it's time to praise, and so I have to muster up strength, and so I should sing something, I should say something. It doesn't even begin with us. Worship can only happen because God has revealed himself to us. God reveals who he is. God reveals what he has done. Through his word, God reveals and we respond in worship. It is always a response to God's revelation. Through his word, through his son, through his spirit. So, that is the proper rhythm of worship. Verse 4 of Psalm 98, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. 
So it begins with beholding his beauty, and as we behold, the natural desire is to bless with all that we have, with all that we are, and all that we are able to be. For those who truly behold him, desire to bless him. And we bless him by lifting up our voices. It says, make a joyful noise. The people of God were known for loud praises because God, our God, is the only God. Amen? And there is no one who is worthy of praises more than our God. He is worthy of the highest praises. I want to give you a small picture into how the people of God, the Israelites, were also known for their praises. Ezra chapter 3, starting from verse 10, it says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and for steadfast love endures forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen for the first, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. So the people could not distinguish between the sound of the joy, joyful shout, from the sound of the people weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. That is how they praised the Lord. That the sound of praise to the only one living true God was heard from far away. Amen. And why do I say this? It's because we are so good at praising such petty things, such small things. We are so good at praising food. Oh my goodness, this is so good. You need to, oh my goodness. Wow. We're good at praising insignificant things. Amen. We are good at resounding loud praises at sport events, especially with the playoffs, the football playoffs going on now. My friends are getting so passionate that my team didn't make it. And they get so passionate about their team's advancement. But God is greater than any sporting events. He is far more worthy of praises than points in a game. But we're so good at that. We're so good at lifting up praises by watching boys play games. God is worthy, far more worthy than points in a game. Amen. We are good at singing loud at concerts. We scream and sing along to our favorite bands and songs that will not last. But there are songs that we are able to sing on Sundays and in small groups and in our private places of worship where those songs will be sung for all of eternity because they sing of the eternal one. Therefore, learn to use the instrument of your voice to express glory to God. Worshiping is lifting up your voice to declare the praises of Jesus. To say that you are worthy to be lived for. You are worthy of this voice to be used loudly for the glory of your name. Because God, I've used this voice loudly often to lift up the praises of man and of food and of concerts and of such petty, small, temporary things. But the psalmist is crying out, God, let my voice, this instrument of my voice, be lifted up on high and be used for the praises 
of all of heaven to join with the angels in lifting up the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is why you have a voice. That is why you have volume in that voice. And that is why I preach with this voice. I would rather lose this instrument by preaching and praising the name of Jesus than to lose it in a concert or a Super Bowl. That is why we are given this instrument for the praises of his name. Amen? Amen. So be loud when it comes time to give him glory. Be free. Be who you were created to be, and that is a worshiper. You're still praying about your major. You're still praying about what to do after college. You're still praying about your next job. That's fine. But one thing is clear. You were created to be a worshiper of Jesus. And so we use the instrument of our voice and of our body to worship the Lord. And we lift up our hearts in worship too. You see, in the Bible, the heart is the center of life and it represents all of life. And true worship is a heart that is fully alive. You see, those who are fully aware of reality, those who are fully aware spiritually, are fully in awe. There's a direct correlation to awareness and awe and life. Because if you come across a body and you're wondering, is this person sleeping, uh, resting, or dead? How do you tell? Does it respond to things? Is it aware of its surroundings? If there's no response, if there's no awareness, if there's no reaction to proper stimulation, something's wrong physically. The same is true spiritually. That when there is not a proper response of affection, when there is a revelation of who God is, something is wrong with the spiritual person there's a direct correlation between how we are able to articulate our emotions and our affections to the living God and the spiritual condition of our life. Those who are fully aware are fully in awe. You know, there's a greater sense of wonder even in things on this earth, like watching an IMAX movie. Have you guys ever seen an IMAX movie with these huge... Huge, huge movie screens. If you've never seen it, it's, it's quite an experience. I encourage you guys to try it. But if you see an IMAX movie, try to see like something of nature or God's creation. That's, I think, far more worthwhile. Uh, when IMAX movies first came out, they were all just nature and creation and stuff like that. And I think it was intentional because it was a fascinating experience. One of my first movies, I think, was on the Grand Canyon or something. And literally, you feel like you are there. You feel like you are flying when it is hovering over the canyons, when it is going through the rivers, and when you're going over over the cliff. You hear in the audience feeling like, <gasps> because they feel like they're about to go over the cliff. Your senses have been designed in such a way because of the environment where you feel fully there. You are more aware of things in creation because it is magnified for the human eye to be able to experience it. And so those who are aware experience a greater sense of awe. You're like, wow. I never saw rivers or oceans or canyons like that. So there's wonder because of what we can see. So this is true for big scale things, but also even in small scale things like a snowflake. You know, um, it snowed this morning. I don't know if you saw it, but if you see it from far away, I mean, it, it looks nice. You know, it's like dots, you know, just falling. That's fine. But I want to show you, uh, I saw recently some close-up images of snowflakes, and I want to show you just a few of them. So if we could, uh, I don't know if you could see. Okay, so you can see on this slide. Um, if we get, 
the image on this, that would be good. Um, so if you could see some of the detail, this is just one snowflake that God created. Uh, what, it's fascinating to me for the incredible detail on every single part of this. Next slide. Okay. And this is fascinating too. I thought it was like a glass plate. So CGN, if actually, if you could also pan onto the image so that people could see what's going on too, that would be good. Uh, so this is fascinating too, uh, how it is so like crystal. You know, it's like glass, the detail. And the next one? You can look the intricate detail behind every portion of this snowflake. And the next, and these are just one. So unique in design, so intricately detailed. So when I looked at this, I was like, wow. You know, this is pretty, I mean, think about it. I mean, no, if I'm God, I'm like, no one's going to care, right? No one's going to see it. So you know how I would probably make snowflake? I would make it like I draw it like a small circle, a small dot. You know, it's like, okay, there you go, right? <laughs> Nobody cares. But when I look at it, I'm like, wow. The kind of detail that they put in. There is always a wow factor in worship. You see, our ability or inability to worship is, a, is in direct proportion to our ability or inability to see the wonder of who he is and what he has done. You see, God is not boring. You might have been, snow is so boring. No, when you look at how God made snow, it is not boring. It is your inability to see what God has truly done. God is not boring. Worship is not boring. God is not dull. The only thing ever dull about worship is our dull senses, inability to respond, see, come to life because we cannot see with the spiritual eyes the glory of even the smallest single snowflake, how that reflects the beauty, the artistry, the majesty of our God. That is why the psalmist cries out, God, open my eyes that I may see and behold the wonderful things in your word. Awaken my spiritual senses to see and to savor and to worship Almighty God. People of God, don't settle for a dead heart. If you cannot respond in worship in a way that has the smallest wow factor or wonder, plead before the Lord in prayer for grace, for awakening, for eyes to see, for ears to hear, for a heart to love. Because if you are not responsive in the place of worship, it is a sign that the spiritual being is not alive. Plead for, pray for, fight for eyes to see. You see, a heart of worship is a life that is fully alive. And my prayer for us this year is that our ministry will come to life this year. But you know, there's another thing that hit me when I thought about these snowflakes. Again, there's so much detail that no one else can see except God. There are so many details also in your life that no one else can see except God. There are so many worries going on in your mind, even now. Your contract's gonna be up this year. Things are tough at home. Future is uncertain. There are so many details that you don't wanna talk about to other people. But God sees them all. Your future job, future studies, future spouse, future children, no one sees those fears. But God does. There are so many scars that you carry, 
from your past, so much hurts, so much pain, so much betrayal that no one else can see but God. God sees. Our God, El Roy, our God who sees, he sees. He sees every detail, every pain, every worry, and he cares about every detail. There is a reason why Jesus reveals that God knows the number of hair on our heads. He's not saying, oh, well, it's in the millions. He's not saying, no, that's not the point. The point is, God cares about every detail of your life. There is nothing too insignificant about your life that you cannot bring to the presence of God through prayer. There is nothing too insignificant. Amen? God cares. He sees. He knows every detail. Our God, Elroy, he sees it all. Nothing is too insignificant for you to share with the heart of God. Hopes, dreams, broken dreams. Lift them up to the Lord. And as you lift up your heart in worship, may you come to life this year. So worship is looking up. It begins there. It's not about us. It's not about how I feel. It's not about am I, did I get enough sleep. It's not about is my seat comfortable. It's not about how this person sings next to me. It begins by looking up and we behold God who is worthy of our praises. Worship begins with looking up but also worship as we look up and see and behold his beauty. Worship is lifting up our life, our heart, our voice in response to the revelation of who God is. But also, worship is giving up. So everyone repeat, worship is giving up. Worship is giving up our lives in sweet surrender to his name. He is the Lord, and he is worthy of worship in our lives. Look at Psalm 98, starting from verse 7. Let the sea roar in all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. He is the Lord. He is the Lord over all the earth, and it says that he is the judge over all. You see, it is only a matter of time before every person and every knee will bow before Jesus as Lord, King, Ruler, Judge over all. And we can either begin doing it now with joy, or we do it later on Judgment Day and face judgment. He will return one day to judge the whole earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the proper response to the one who holds all authority to judge and rule and reign over all the earth, the proper response is to bow and kneel in reverence, in worship, and surrender. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Surrender is spiritual worship before the Lord. We see this in movies all the time. Right? Bank robber scene, gun, stick them up. Put up your hands. Why? It is a sign of surrender. And we're called to live a life of surrender to the one who reigns over all. Surrender your dreams, your goals, your plans on the altar of sacrifice and it will become a sweet fragrance of worship before the throne. But the problem with being a sacrifice that is alive is that it will crawl off the altar. It is like trying to change the diaper of a baby that is awake and he will go everywhere. Same problem. But that problem of a living sacrifice that will crawl off the altar, the solution is we need to sacrifice our lives over and over again each day. Say, God, here's my heart again. 
Why? Because my heart is prone to wander in so many seasons of life. That we commit our lives, God, all that I am is yours. We sang last Sunday, and then on Monday, our hearts prone to wander again and again because of the worries and cares and the desires that we have for this world. And I realize that we need to do this in all seasons of our lives. As a single, God, I surrender my life, my future, all that I am to you. And then you get married, and then there are different worries, desiring to protect and provide for your spouse. And then you need to surrender that again. Say, God, I surrender the desire to be in control, wanting to be God in this marriage. I surrender to you. And then you have kids. And then worries about their future and their future spouse and their future college. And all these worries build up again. And you need to surrender that heart again to the Lord. Say, God, I will trust you again and again and again. God, here's my heart again. Because it's devoted and then divided. And so we need to devote again, and then it's divided. That is how the human heart is. So here's my life again. Here's my future again, my hopes and my dreams again. It is giving up our lives and surrender at the foot of the cross again and again and again. It is learning to die each day so that we can truly live each day as God intended. It is remembering a death and remembering to love. You know, besides the rule of the Roman Empire around the world, few nations experienced global power and influence like Great Britain did during Queen Victoria's reign. She, <clears throat> during that time period, um, she ruled over so much of the world, built key alliances with other parts of the world, had such a strong global kingdom ruling uh, influence that her name and her image is still honored in countries around the world. Um, <clears throat> In the UK, Australia, and other British colonies, they still have states or cities or buildings or parks named after her. You know, when I lived in Australia, I would fly from Sydney to Melbourne and different things like that. And, you know, there's a Queen Victoria building, there's a Victoria State, there's a Queen Victoria Park. I mean, there's, everything is named after her. I never knew why. So I studied a little bit, and I discovered some interesting things about her. She became queen at the age of 18, uh, that's pretty phenomenal that w at such a young age, she built such a powerful empire globally. She later married Prince Albert, which was actually a cousin, which I won't get too into right now because it's <laughs> kind of weird, right? But it's okay. Let's pretend like I didn't read that, okay? Um, but she loved him deeply. She loved him uh, so much. So they had nine children, but then he died prematurely. And when her husband died, she was so heartbroken and she wanted to let the world know how much she loved her spouse that she decided to wear black mourning clothes for the rest of her life, which is what she did. Now think about this. Queen, powerful, she could do anything, she could get anyone, she could command people to marry her if she wanted. She could wear whatever she wanted, but she chose to wear black mourning clothes for the rest of her life. It was a sign to tell everyone, my heart, my life, my love will forever belong to this person. She was giving up her rights. She was giving up her hearts in full surrender to her husband for the rest of her life. It was a symbol of love through surrender. And I was reflecting about that. I was like, man, that is such a beautiful picture of what the church is to look like. That we wear 
these clothes that symbolize a death, the death of Christ. But we do this glad surrender to symbolize love because of our love for Him. So much of love is expressed in surrender and in giving. Even God, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. That was His expression of love to us. And we love because He first loved us. And that reality and that truth of God's love seen through His Son causes us to look up to the cross, to lift up our hearts and to give up our lives in joyful surrender. It is the truth and the reality of the gospel that is the basics of worship and that is the basis of our worship. So people of God, look up. And with gladness of hearts, give up gladly to Him. That is worship. And that is the one who alone is worthy of your worship. Amen.